Praise the Lord, everybody. We could all stand tonight. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord. Glad to be here. I know it's nasty outside, a lot of rain, the parking lot's flooded, but guess what? The Spirit of the Lord is here, amen? He's here to do a work tonight. If you don't know him, you can know him before you leave tonight. If you have sickness in your body, you can leave healed tonight. If you're going through troubles and trials, you can leave free tonight. Amen. This could be the day that changes your life. Brother Billy, it's how we come into the situation. Did we come expecting God to do something? Well, I come tonight expecting God to have his way in this place. Amen. That no matter what we faced all week, no matter what we go through, when we begin to praise together and magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he's going to be right there in the midst of us. Amen. I'm thankful for what I feel in the house tonight. I'm thankful for what God wants to do in this place tonight. I don't know how many of you read the chapter they asked us to read, chapter 11, but it's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. I read it today and I was like, wow, Brother Shannon, this is, this is something. So I'm looking forward to hearing what we're going to hear tonight. I'm looking forward to what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. Amen. If you have any prayer requests tonight, just let them be made known by the raising your hand. God knows each and every single one of them. Let's go before him tonight. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for each and every one that is here tonight, Lord. We thank you, God, for your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. We thank you, God, that no matter how broken we may feel, we don't have to be destroyed, God. We can look to you for which cometh our strength. God, we can lift up holy hands in the temple and begin to magnify you, God, and praise you. God, and we're doing that tonight. We're asking, Lord, in faith believing that you're going to touch and move upon every single need, God, that was mentioned in this place. God, you're an awesome God. You're a holy God, a mighty God, and we praise you. We magnify you, Lord, and we thank you for your promises that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. We thank you, Lord, that you said, Lord, will be with you always even until the end of the world god it's a promise we can stand by it's a promise we can lift up hands to and magnify you god and know that you're always going to be there god i magnify you tonight and i praise you tonight and i thank you for what you're going to do in this place tonight if we'll just allow you to lord i thank you and i lift up that name that is above every name in the mighty name of jesus amen and the church said Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him tonight for his goodness and his mercy.
you, Lord. Aren't you glad you know him in the house tonight? Amen. You may be seated. I know I wrote it in the, the bulletin this Sunday, but in case some of y'all didn't see it. Brother David, I was driving down the road the other day. I seen this big old dogwood tree. Man, it was pretty. All leaves all over it, blooms all over it. Terrence, as I drove by, I saw a big old limb just hanging down off of the dogwood tree. And I said, man, that's misfortunate. The limbs broke. But the closer I got to it, I seen it had buds on it still. It had blooms on it still. And then the scripture came to me about being connected to the vine. And I thought, man, even though that limb was broken, and a lot of people would write it off as, well, it's no good anymore. It still produced blooms. Then I got to thinking, Sister Nadine, you know, if that was a fruit tree, as long as it stayed connected, it was going to produce fruit. And some animals might not be able to reach to the highest limb to get some fruit. So sometimes it takes us being broken down a little bit for other people to be able to come by and get a little fruit off of us as well. Amen. Sometimes it takes us going through some situations and some circumstances so God gets the glory. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that no matter what we go through and no matter what we face, if we stay connected to him, He's going to get the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you could, let's give them the ways to give upon the board tonight. We have this Riverbend text to give that, that y'all know about. We have Giveify. We have PayPal at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can also give your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Amen. I know Sister Meredith did a good job last week telling about this prayer, and I am thankful for this prayer. I know I say it all the time. It's not magical, but it's faith. It's just believing. That's all it is. You believe that God is going to do what he said he would do, and I do believe that. It might not be a pile of money that you're fixing to get, but you don't know how many times the hand of protection has bit upon you, Brother Billy. You don't know how many times he's guarded you and kept you. And your kids might have been getting sick or something might have been fixing to happen in his hand of mercies upon you through your obedience. Amen. So that's what I want to be is obedient. I want to be what he would have me to be. And I do that. And I show my love to him by being obedient to him. Amen. So if you could, let's all stand in the house. We're going to pray this prayer tonight and then we're going to give you a chance to give. Wooden pans are for your offering. Your gold pans are for your tithes. Let's pray this prayer with faith tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I am a tither and I give my offerings and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, Benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what God has blessed you with.
Let's give the Lord some praise now. Let's give the Lord some praise. Wednesday night praise. There ain't none like it. There ain't none like it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His mercy taught me how to dance. His mercy taught me how to dance. His mercy taught me. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I just want to do a little housekeeping real quickly before we dismiss. I want to just say a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, we, uh, we're thrilled to death. We have, uh, uh, we're going to be down a little bit tonight, not a lot, but we've been bumping 100 on Wednesday nights for the last several weeks. Um, 91, 91, 86, and 91 has been our last three Wednesday night attendances. And a lot of that is... Uh, students, that's the uh, 12 to 18 crowd, and then our Riverbend kids, which is the, uh, I forgot, 4 to 11. Sometimes we waffle on the 3 a little bit, but uh, I, I don't really want to talk to the little ones tonight, Riverbend uh, uh, kids, except you're going to be Riverbend ignited pretty soon, all right? We're going to keep growing. We're going to see many more students and children come here. All right? A lot of them ain't going to know how to act in church and in class. You're going to have to teach them. I want you to have a great time back there. I want you to have a great time. We'll spend whatever we got to spend. We'll get whatever we got to do. Uh, I know I've told at least Sister Casey one time, uh, whatever you need, let me know. We'll see you have it. And, but I, I want us to realize it's still church. Okay? And we want it to be able to grow. And the Lord won't let us grow until we're ready for it. Now, Brother Richard... Brother Tripp, Sister Meredith, Sister Casey, Sister Kim, Brother Terrence, uh, Brother Blake, Brother Larry, and Sister Ashley, they put a lot of effort in over there, and they work hard, and I, that team is going to grow, not shrink. All right? It is. It is. So let's go back tonight and have a great time, right? A ton of fun, great time. Um, I got something to tell, but I'm not going to tell it. I want to really, really bad. Um, well, I, when you're on TV, you don't tell everything <laughs> that you know. Uh, but I'm also going to say this, and I ain't putting a damper on this service. This Bible study tonight, get ready to have your mind blown. Not by me, but by the content of it. How many read chapter 11? How many of you said, hmm, a few times? I did. I did, and it's going to be great. I'm not quenching the service, but I want to tell everybody here, I want it to go out online, all right? And I want everybody here to know uh, we're going to grow, and we're going to have all kinds of people here. And I want you to know now, and I want it to be part of our culture. If anyone ever treats anyone inappropriately here with our children, with our students, or even our adults, we will turn it over to the authorities immediately and let them handle it. I want you to know that, all right? There won't be no, oh, give me a, no. That's, that's not our job. But there's been some things going on in the church world, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, all right? We will, that's not our job. We are what you call mandated reporters as pastors, all right? And I will turn it over to the authorities and let them ask the questions. So mind your P's and Q's. Adults, don't be alone with children. We're going to grow. We're going to grow. And we need to learn how to behave ourselves and how to handle ourselves in the world that we live in now. Right? So don't be alone with, with children or students. Don't be texting little private conversations with students and children that ain't yours. 
It, it is what it is. And if I hear of anything out of kelter, I will get the authorities involved. My one, I, If I hear it on a phone call, I will hang up the phone and I will call the police. Please understand that. All right? I don't care who it is. I mean that. We're Christians. And this is going to be a safe place for everybody. Amen? For everybody. So... Thank you for indulging me for a few moments. Like for the River Bend kids to, thank you, brother. River Bend kids come line up here across the front. I know there's some that didn't come tonight because of the weather. Uh, but uh, that one monkey don't stop no show, they tell me. All right, head on back, Chrisley. And then I want to remind you that there's a rally Sunday night. Uh, in steel, I'd like everybody that could. It's one of those Sunday night rallies. Starts at 454. That was a good motor. 454 at steel. Uh, River Bend ignited. You can be dismissed. It won't be quite as lengthy as this series has been, but I think we may try to incorporate the bait of Satan into a discipleship track or a membership track, for lack of a better word, as we, we're working on establishing some classes uh, and uh, going to teach a lot of stuff in them classes uh, about uh, a Christian life. And uh, oh, a lot of good things are happening. And we're in the bait of Satan, chapter number 11. Uh, and I'm honest with you, when I first read it, I thought, well, this ain't a very long chapter. I may be able to do 11 and 12. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Not happening. But I am going to get through with 11 tonight by the help of the Lord. Um, I want to tell you that uh, 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 we had did a prayer cloth for Mr. Ricky Howe and uh, his surgery they were anticipating that taking a large portion of his stomach out. That's Sister Sandy's brother, Sister Virginia's son. And uh, they got in there and didn't have to take nearly what they thought. And they found about three spots on his stomach. And they got the test back today, and all of them are benign. There was no problems at all. So thank the Lord for that. He said to tell the church that he knows it was the hand of the Lord. He knows it was. So... 11, 12, 13, and 14, we have four chapters left of the bait of Satan. And they will focus, the remainder of this series will focus on the consequences of refusing to let go of offense and how to get free from offense. Um, Mark 11, 24 through 26, uh, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there real fast. What does that tell you? When ye pray. Praying is part of a Christian life. Get a prayer life. You don't have to start praying an hour a day, but you better square off some time. That's the Lord's time on your calendar and pray. We've give you prayer patterns. We've got prayer, different prayer guides. We're happy to give you out. I'm going to give you one tonight at the end of this, perhaps, if you're interested in it. And uh, it is elementary to the Christian life that you pray. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Amen. We prayed for Kevin, and it disappeared. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. So whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, so during your prayer time, forgive if you have anything against anybody. 
That's part of your prayer time. Forgive if you have ought. That means anything against anybody that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. I could shut my Bible, say let's stand and go home after that. It means what it says. Now, unforgiveness, I want you to hear me now, unforgiveness is unforgivable. I know the Bible says the only unforgivable sin is blasphemy, all right? But unbelief is also unforgivable. If you won't believe, you're not going to be forgiven, okay? And we know that belief and obedience are inextricably tied together in the Bible. If you believe, you obey, all right? And to hold on to unforgiveness is to be disobedient to the word of God. And I want you to hear me. This is not Pastor GL judging. This is the word of God. And you will be judged by the word of God. This is part of the final judgment. How you lived your life according to the word of God. Unforgiveness is unforgivable. And it is for sure a salvation issue. And if it is unaddressed, it will result in the offender being lost. You're not going to heaven holding on to something against somebody. Okay, I'm glad everybody's with me. So, does he really mean that? We say things we don't mean all the time. We need to work on that. Because ladies and gentlemen, dress it up, spice it up, put lipstick on it and hang on some earrings on it. It's a lie. Got to stop it. It's not malicious. It's not out to hurt nobody. But if you say something you don't mean, it's a lie. Okay. Okay. Brother Shannon, we talked about it. it's going to get tough tonight. This is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. The hustle and bustle of life and the media's mishmash of legalese dealing with disciplining children, what's right, what's wrong, what you should, what you shouldn't, it has all of that conglomerated together. We're busy, we're flustered, we're overwhelmed, and now we're assaulted by everybody else's opinion on everything with social media and the news media. It's, you're just a, you don't even know what to believe or what to think. So it has resulted in many of us teaching our children that people in positions of authority just really don't mean what they're saying. For instance, if you tell your child, if you do that, I'm going to spank your bottom. And you don't, you taught them a lesson. You don't mean what you say. Or we tell them we're going to ground them for their phone for a month. And then three days in, we realize that's an inconvenience on us. So we decide giving it back to them. You didn't keep your word. Now, say, well, I mean, that's not a big deal. I just showed a little mercy. But when we do that continually and don't follow through, we teach them that we're either a liar or we just simply don't mean anything we say. Now, when they start school, they automatically assume that everything the teacher says is just a suggestion too. Doesn't really mean anything. And then you got coaches and pastors, bosses, etc. And we have established a culture that don't think anybody that anything that anybody says, they really mean it. That's why kids can say, I'll kill you. See it in the movies. You know? Oh, I didn't really mean it. You know how people just say stuff. It has become a part of our society. Now we have created a cycle of distrust. Then they find out 
that sometimes people really mean what they say and it gives an attitude, it gives birth to an attitude of confusion. I don't know who to believe. I don't know what to say. So that attitude of confusion only finds safety in one place. You know what that is? I'm not going to trust anybody, anywhere, anytime. I'm just going to build myself into a wall. And I know, I know I trust me. Okay? And unfortunately, that has also seeped into the church. And we find ourselves reading the Bible with the same attitude. Situationally applying it. Kind of like situational ethics. I had somebody tell me one time, everybody lies. Everybody tells a lie sometimes. I don't think that's true. Okay? I don't think you have to lie to survive in the world. Because the Bible says all liars are going to hell. Yep. Six things the Lord hate. The lying tongue's one of them. Okay? Now, I got some stuff I was going to say, but I marked out. So when Jesus says it, he means it. It's not just an empty threat. Maybe it's just a strong suggestion. We ask ourselves this question. Reckon that includes what I've been through and how I've been treated? Now, Jesus repeated this principle over and again. You see Matthew 6 12, 14, 15, and then Luke 6 and 37, among other places, he repeated that refrain often, and it's actually included in what's called the Lord's Prayer. Okay, forgive us as we forgive others. It is a principle that the Lord wants us to know is essential, and it's not a principle, but a commandment. This is something we got to get right, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to get this right because our salvation depends on it. Now, the way we forgive equals the way we will be forgiven. You understand that? It says over here in the original scripture, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. You are, we are giving God permission to keep his word to us when we obey his word. Now, the wide, there is a widespread, and I'm going to use this word because it really hits us, pandemic of unforgiveness in our world. And it is accompanied by the justification of bitterness, strife, jealousy, sinful anger, discord, etc. So we want to offer ourselves a pass on the words of God. We want to, we want to pass while we want him to still stick to his plan for forgiveness like he wants it to be. We want unconditional forgiveness, but we want to pass on ours. That's not a generality, it's the truth. We think because our situation's worse than anybody else's that we need a pass. That don't really apply to me. I promise you, as I've been teaching the bait of Satan, there have been caveats just running through our minds. I know that's what it says, but I know what I've been through, and I just can't forgive that. So that must mean, and, and then here's this one. We're about to get to it in a little bit. I prayed and asked the Lord to help me, and he didn't, so he must not want me to. Dog don't hunt. Well, look here. The manner in which I offer or choose not to offer forgiveness is the same pattern by which God forgives me. So in effect, Brother David, I determine his level of grace and mercy 
that is loosed in my life. Hmm. I'm not sure that everything leading up to this ain't been preparing us for this. Now, I'm really going to unpack something right now. It's a story in John Bevere's book, but I read it and I'm going to tell it because everybody ain't read the book. Shame, 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 everybody knows your name. That's what Gomer Powell used to say. There's a story, a strong indicator of the power of unforgiveness. There's a wealthy lady, a widow. She attended a revival meeting. They had, the revival was 10 services. She came to every one of them, all 10. She was a giver. She paid a large portion of the travel expenses for the evangelist and his family to come. He was in a foreign country. They were at the breakfast table. The evangelist and this lady, everyone else had left, and she turned to the evangelist and said, who happens to be the author of this book, and she said, John, why have I never felt the presence of God? She said, I come to every service. I've listened closely to everything you have said. I've come to the front and repented. But I have not felt the presence of God not even once. Truth is, I've never felt the presence of God. I want you to hear me. This is not a unique situation. And truth is, while hers is extreme, having never felt the presence of God, this same thing is true at many different levels. Now, I felt the power of the Holy Ghost very strongly as I began to read this. Such of those levels are, I feel the presence of the Lord, but I can't get a breakthrough. Or I'm having trouble receiving the Holy Ghost. I feel the power of God and I feel drawn, but then when I, when I get there and get to pray and then it's like everything just shuts down. Or I really felt this. Boy, I'm having trouble laying down one or two or three bad habits. And I can't get a breakthrough. And it don't make no sense. I know God wants me to be free. I know God wants me to be delivered. But I can't get it. And I want it. But it don't make sense. See, I think this applies at a whole lot of different levels. So, John, who's prayed a bunch of people through to the Holy Ghost... He uh, talked to her a little bit longer, and then he laid hands on her. I'm just going to pray for her to get the Holy Ghost. I can pray anybody through to the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've had that same thing happen. Okay? And he said, I didn't feel a thing when I prayed for her. Nothing. Didn't sense the presence of the Lord. Didn't, I didn't have a breakthrough. I didn't feel nothing, except I felt the Lord speak to me and say, now, are y'all going to let the Lord minister to you right now? Because he's going to with this next little part. It's so powerful. The Lord impressed John and said, she's holding unforgiveness against her husband. Tell her to forgive him. Now, her husband's actually dead and gone now. So John stopped praying for her. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. John stopped praying for her, and he told her, you need to forgive your husband. Now, I want you to hear what I'm about to say, because what she does next is something that's very common among us. She said, you're right. I haven't forgiven him. And I've done my best to forgive him. Now, here's why that's powerful. What is she saying? She's basically telling him it ain't happening. She can't do it. She gave it her all. She gave it her best. And so it is, it is truly a, a, a declaration of justification, which means gave it my best. I tried my best, and it didn't happen. You're right, and I've done my best to forgive him. 
This is where we step over into the arena of the supernatural and we find out how much God really wants you full of the Holy Ghost. This was justification for not forgiving him because after all, she'd done her best. Then she began to tell John of all the horrible things her husband did to her. And she talked and talked and it was an extensive list. And after she got through talking, John said, it wasn't hard to figure out why she was struggling. Dude was terrible. Okay? He did some horrible things to her. So it wasn't hard to see why she struggled with forgiving him. But that didn't negate the truth of Scripture. I know people have been through some bad stuff. You know, I felt this the other day. And please don't think I'm sacrilegious. Please don't. But there are people among us that actually endured longer and deeper abuse than Jesus himself did. His was over in a couple of days. Matter of fact, one evening and one morning. It was the process of the, the perfect lamb. He was not the worst sufferer the world has ever seen. Matter of fact, Brother Billy, it could be argued that some of the disciples suffered worse things than Jesus did. They were sawn asunder. You know what that means? They were laid down on a block. Somebody fired up a saw and cut them in half with it while they're still alive. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs, Brother David. They used to create things that they could pour like cloth with razor blade type stuff in it down a person's body and leave it out and then just rip it out. Christians. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to, to make you, you know, I, I want you to know there's been people been through some stuff. That was Christians. They did it for the church, but they, they did. They made them walk, walk out in the water and drove them out there to walk and drown themselves. Kill themselves, basically. And, and, the, and the list could go on. I told some of the, the prettier ones. People have been through some things. Little children mistreated. Ladies and men mistreated and abused. They boiled John the Revelator in hot oil. Boiled him. But none of those things render the word of God null and void in your situation. Say, man, I think you're being a little graphic. No, I'm being a little real. Because we all think we got somewhere in there we get a pass because it's been hard. Well, let me tell you something, baby. It wasn't so hard that it stopped you from being where you are right now. Huh? You made it to today. Man, y'all feel the Holy Ghost in here? Boy, I feel the power of God. I feel the power of God. And I know this is kind of shaky a little bit for us, but uh, it, this is the word. This is the word. This dude treated her terrible, horrible things that he had done to her. But that didn't negate the truth of Scripture. If you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. Is anybody having trouble with what I'm saying right now? I want you to be honest. Is anybody having any trouble struggling a little bit with what I'm saying right now? All right, we're going to pray about it in just a few minutes. Y'all comfortable with praying in the middle of church, in the middle of Bible study? Yes, ma'am. One thing I find that I struggle with is when I forgive somebody, I don't know how to or do not feel that guilt if they don't reciprocate and say, well, so I don't know how to get past that. Or I have to say, okay, you know what, it's been God's hand. You're not getting past that. Okay, so it's not yours to get past. Hundred percent. I, I, I'm not being ugly, but I, I'm telling you, recovery. First principle of celebrate recovery is I have to realize I am not God. All right, forgiveness. Please hear me right now. Forgiveness is for nobody but you. You're not forgiving them 
for them. And your reward is not their response. Your reward is being right with God and unloosing, unleashing the authority and the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me just take it another step. Unleashing the authority and the power of the cross in your life. The redemptive power of the cross hinges on you offering forgiveness. Now, I've, I've got a prayer here I'm going to give out. But I want to read it to you, the first line. Forgiveness is not determined by our emotions. Forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not because I feel like I need to ask them to forgive me or offer them forgiveness. It's because God said I have to do it and I want to please God. It doesn't even, listen to this. This is for you. I want you to give you a copy of this. I didn't make enough for everybody because I didn't have faith you'd want one. It's 100% truth. It doesn't matter if we feel an emotional release when we speak the words of forgiveness. Emotions will follow. When we speak the words of forgiveness, we give up our right to get even and we give up our right to be justified. I give it up. Because, Brother David, I've been reading this lately. The whole, Jesus was silent in Pilate's judgment hall. Number one, he didn't owe them nothing. But number two, if he starts speaking, things are going to change. But he did not need justification from Pilate. He didn't need justification for them. He needed to go to the cross. That's who he was. Okay? It's a choice. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 But actually what... Ooh, Jesus. What actually happens there, Sister Crystal, is you put yourself in a position to finally start really helping them. You couldn't do it holding that stuff against them and you felt like, well, I forgave you so now you ought to fall down and wash my feet for me. All right? No. What happened is you forgave them and it moved you in a position of effectiveness that you never had before. So if you really want to help them, turn loose of all of that and then let the power of God start working through you like he wants to because as long as you're holding it, he can't work through you. Uh -huh. That's where I've, where I've lived that kind of mind so long that I'm trying to say, you know what, I don't, I'm not saying just pull the wall, but just stop talking. I, I, I don't want to dispute you, and I don't want to be ugly to you, but if you're feeling that way, you ain't forgive them. Okay. And, that, that's what I need. and thank you for saying that. Because a whole lot of us are rolling in that same place. But if, if you're still waiting, well, I'm waiting. I'm waiting until they tell me they appreciate me saying I forgave them. I'm waiting on them to say they're sorry. Yeah. It has nothing to do with that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You don't do it for a response. Right. You do it to set yourself free. Okay. That's exactly right. And you give them power. You let them move into your mind and your heart. You give them power. Yes, sir. Well, I read a quote by Martin Luther about forgiveness. He said, forgiveness is not an occasional act, but it's a constant attitude. It is. It is because, well, Jesus was like that. He was looking for an opportunity to forgive people. Even from the beginning, when Cain messed up, he, the Lord came to him and said, okay, bud, let's get this right. Because that's who he is. That's his nature. All right. What would you say, Lacey, a while ago? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you're receiving your validation on this level instead of on this level. Okay. Everybody with us? Y'all going to hang with me a little bit? Okay. Somebody say, Pfft. I thought that's what he was going to say. 
But here, we, we got to get through this, folks. Yes, sir. Um, that's between you and God. Sometimes it's not wise, you know, and, and recovery actually talks about that, you know, in the, in the recovery thing. Sometimes it's not wise, and, and unfortunately, often, they don't even know about it anyway. Sometimes you go to them and start telling, I've, I want you to forgive me for this, this, and this, and then when you walk away, they don't like you no more because they didn't even know because this is stuff going on in me. Now, if I've been mistreating them and I've been being ugly to them and I've been calling them names and I've been gossiping about them, then I probably need to try to make that right. But the way I really make it right, stop. Because I can't fix words that come out of my mouth. I have heard studies before that say every word that has ever been spoken since creation is still floating around out there somewhere in the, in the, in the sound waves. I can't, once the words go out, you can't ever put them back. And once the actions are done, they're done. So the, the goal, Brother Cody, that's a good question. But the goal is I got, I'm getting right with God. And here's how I feel. is and, and the scripture backs it up. You come bringing your sacrifice. And you remember your brother's got all against you, which means you've done him wrong. So leave your sacrifice there. Go fix it. So I, I feel very strongly. You go taking something to the Lord and, and offering forgiveness and, and uh, getting things unloaded, if there needs to be further action, Holy Ghost will lead you there. And he, most of the time, he'll lead you there before you want to be there. Like he'll open the door and say, all right, buddy, do you really mean that? Because I'm going to talk about it a little later on. The Bible very clearly says it's a heart issue, not a mouth issue. And if you say, I forgive you, and then you go home at night and you're laying in the bed dreaming up ways to mess up their car before they get to work in the morning, you ain't forgave them. Dreaming up ways about punching them. If you hear me right now, this is GL talking to you. It happened. You dreaming at night, you beat them up. You dreaming at night you run them off the road? You dreaming at night you shot them? You better get back in the altar. You ain't forgave them. Oh, come on now. Come on now. You got to, you got to, that, your, your spirit will betray you if you ain't got it right. The Lord's going to bring it back to the surface. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm fixing to hit it, and I'm going to hit it hard in just a few minutes. Yes, and it has the same ramifications. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. That's it. Yeah. True. Because you ain't doing it for them anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really think that we're going to get to a place in our Christian walk where all of it's handled that way. Because as soon as old Ned rises up in us and we start thinking about somebody in a way we shouldn't, or, or we start, you know, because before you went and gossiped about them, you didn't like them when you was all by yourself. So I, as I mature in the Holy Ghost, I'm going to recognize when the old man starts rising up in me, and I'm going to get on my knees right then, and I'm going to say, all right, Lord, i got to get this right. I'm telling you the truth. You, as you mature in the Lord, we are going to get to a place where we cut the devil off at the pass. And before it comes out of me and everything got a whole lot worse, I done took care of it. Because if it rose up in me in private, I got a problem. Yes, Brother Billy.
Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Good point. Good story. Mm -hmm. You you said that exactly right because when I'm in alignment, my alignment with God cannot be hindered by somebody else. It can only be hindered by me. All right? Make sense? All right? So what she had to do was become a servant, and that's called humbling yourself. Yeah. It'll happen. The Lord will let your enemy be on a flat on the side of the road, and you're the only one in sight, and you got to stop and help them. I'm telling you, it'll happen. It'll happen. Okay. Now, so we got with the little widow woman said, I never felt the Holy Ghost before. I never felt. So the Lord told John, she's got to forgive her husband. Well, her husband's dead. Besides that, she done did her best to forgive him. Didn't work. She did her best. Okay. John told her, said, if you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. Repentance is being forgiven. All right, she couldn't get past repentance. It's why she couldn't get the Holy Ghost. All right, because God couldn't forgive her of her sins because she hadn't. She knew she held this in her heart, and we all do. We all do. All right, and then John told her this. He said, "You cannot forgive him under your own strength. You must first. Now, here we go. Hear me right now." You must first ask God to forgive you. And I promise, I got in my notes right now. Sister Heidi can tell you, for what? Dude did that to me. That man made my life miserable. He made my life terrible. Why do I got to ask God to forgive me? Why? Because I'm not in alignment. I've got unforgiveness in my heart. So I got to ask the Lord to forgive me for being rebellious. Okay? I got to ask the Lord to forgive me for holding on to unforgiveness. The only reason I hold on to it, Sister Crystal, and I'm not meaning to use you, but you did after all. Raise your hand. Uh, if I'm waiting on a response, I'm still holding on to unforgiveness because I'm not going to really turn it loose. I'm not going to really feel relief until they acknowledge me. Well, what about this gal? Husband's dead. Hmm. Hmm. He ain't coming back to say, no problem. I forgive you. So look here. In the process of first being forgiven, she had to ask God to forgive her, not just for holding on to unforgiveness, but for doubt. I did my best. Didn't happen. She didn't give God a chance. Tried to be God. Look here. In the process of first being forgiven, we loose the power of God to heal our hearts, which then strengthens us and it enables us to break the strongholds of unforgiveness. And you see, it's a two-way street, all right? Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 5, blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. You know what that means? Happy is, oh, let me, let me talk to you about it a little bit. It is a willful and cheerful submission to the will of God fueled by a recognition that I cannot do this without him, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. All right? And the task I need is beyond my own talents and my own abilities and even my own reach. It is the offering of ourselves in total submission to the will of God. 
When I understand the Bible teaches that I can be happy acknowledging that I can't do something. Blessed are the poor in spirit because that is an acknowledgement. Lord, I can't do this. I need you to help me. I bet nobody's ever thought about that before. Lord, I need you to help me lay this stuff down. And I want you to forgive me because I didn't trust you to do it. It is the greatest, I hope this makes sense, it is the greatest expression of grace. Look here. He has given me the grace to offer that which I cannot offer alone which will then result in the grace of God for salvation being offered to me. He gives me grace to do his will so I can get in alignment and receive his spirit. That's how bad God wants you to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So bad that he said it's a gift. It's a gift. So, Lord, forgive me when I got that taken care of. And let me tell you something. I felt this from recovery last Thursday night, and I'm going to throw it out there at you again. Some things you need to get worked out with the Lord can't be worked out in 30 seconds. Sometimes you have to say, Brother Larry, all right, Lord, I need you to search me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the right way, the way everlasting. All right? So then I forgive them because now I have strength to through grace. The grace of God came and gave me strength to forgive them and I'm brought, once again, here we go, into alignment with the will of God which is the true mission of repentance which means repentance really means a turn but what it means is it's a turn from my will to God's will that I couldn't do without grace. Huh? Come on now. Okay. And now that which was incomplete in my efforts is now made complete, which that's what grace has always been. I go as far as I can get. And then he builds a bridge. Grace builds a bridge to from my greatest efforts into the perfect will of God. Okay, now, so they prayed a simple prayer. First, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me for holding things that I shouldn't. Forgive me for holding unforgiveness and forgive me. For goodness sake, forgive me for believing that there is a failure that can't be forgiven. Okay, hold on to that thought. Now, Lord, I've tried to forgive him, but I was unsuccessful. But before God, in the presence of the Lord, I now release him from my heart. I forgive him. Then John spoke this to her. Now lift up your hands and speak in other tongues. And guess what? She did. She began to speak fluently in a beautiful heavenly language. She began to weep because there was a breakthrough. She had not wept in her son's life. But as she turned loose of that grudge, of that offense against her husband, a dam broke in her. And she began to weep and to cry and speak in other tongues filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Only two things can stop you from receiving the Holy Ghost, unrepented sin and a lack of faith. It's only two things. It's a gift. Unforgiveness was a prison from which she could not break free on her own. But God. But God. But God. Now, before I go any further, I want us to pray a minute. Just where you're sitting. If you got something 
the Lord's been speaking to you while we've been going through this lesson tonight. And there may be any number of things that you're struggling with in your life that unforgiveness is the wall holding them in you. So I'd like us to just pray. Twofold prayer. What's the first prayer going to be? Forgive me for holding on to that. And then the second prayer is going to be, now I forgive them. Since the penalty for me is gone, now I have strength to forgive them. You, you don't have to say it out loud. I'm going to give you a prayer pattern for a time when you're by yourself when you need to say it out loud. Okay? But will you pray with me? Let's just pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm grateful for this story that's been shared with us. And I'm thankful for this, this lesson that we're learning. And God, I, I want to ask you if there's anything holed up in this heart or in my mind that I haven't turned loose of or that maybe I'm waiting on justification for or validation for, things that keep coming back to my mind all the time, wrong things that people have done to me, Lord, I want to ask you to forgive me for not turning loose of them. I ask you to forgive me for holding on to things that you had the power to set free. Forgive me, God, for not trusting in your grace to give me what I needed to do, what brought me into alignment with you. Forgive me, Lord, if I'm holding on to stuff that I shouldn't. Forgive me, God, that, uh, that I didn't trust you like I should. Forgive me for not letting you be God in my life in every way. Forgive me. Now, Lord, I, I'm, I'm just turning loose of all of that. I'm turning loose. Of that. I'm getting it out of my heart. I release it from my heart, just like this lady did for her husband that had mistreated her terrible. God, I'm releasing. Those people that talk about me, I'm releasing them, Lord. Those people that work against everything we try to do, I'm releasing them, Lord. Those people that don't cooperate in any way and it hurts my feelings and I take it personal, I'm just going to release them, Lord, and let it go because I want to be in perfect alignment with you. And I can't help them if I'm messed up in myself, God. So bring me to a place, God, where I can be what you want me to be. I pray you'll let that stronghold come down in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now we got the unforgiving servant. Hang with me for about 10 more minutes or so. I'd want to be done by 8.15, but I ain't been done by 8.15 since before COVID. So. Sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's right. Absolutely. Let it go. And and that's why we talk about driving a stake in the ground or a line in the sand that says, I'm gonna go back to that place. I'm gonna go back to that place and then I'm gonna tell the devil, don't be bringing that weak junk here. Because it was right here when I was delivered. It was right here when I was set free. It was right here when I turned that loose. Josh. We're fixing to talk about that. If I can get there. I'm going I'm to make sure I get there. If you got to go, I'm going to tell you like Brother Carpenter said, there will be no formal release. No. <laughs> if you got to go, you just got to go. But I want to get here because now two people have asked about that. I think it's important we deal with it. Okay. Now. So Peter comes in Matthew, the 18th chapter, that Jesus was teaching the disciples how to get reconciled with a brother who had offended them. And Peter comes to the Lord and says, okay, how many times do I keep forgiving my brother who keeps on sinning against me? And then he answered his own question, Brother David, which Proverbs tells us is unwise, answering a matter before you hear it, unwise. Oh, that's Pedro, all right. Now, Peter says, how about seven times? And it appears that Peter felt like he had a pretty good idea on how many times is enough before you don't have to forgive them no more because that's what he was asking. What point do they have to get to where I don't have to forgive them no more because that's what I'm really interested in? 
Now, we know Peter always tried to impress Jesus with his spirituality. You know, I'm, I'll die with you. I won't abandon you. I'm the man with the plan. You count on me right before that rooster conversation, remember? And so Peter, I feel like, and I agree with John Bevere, Peter thought seven times. What about that? What do you think about that? I bet there ain't many people out here that'll forgive somebody seven times for doing the same thing to them. What do you think about that, Mr. Jesus? Teacher's pet. And you know what Jesus said? Not even close, bud. He said, you're not even close. He said, I don't say seven times. Now, what Jesus did right there is he just declared how the carnal mind works seven times. But he said, I do say 70 times seven which lends itself to the principle, to the idea, to the message to us that to forgive like Jesus forgives is an infinite number. And that's how the spiritual mind thinks. You ready for this? There's no limit to forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm proud of that. Because I'm telling you before God and everybody, there's a lot of times I repented of something that I didn't stop doing. And you know what he kept doing, Brother David? Forgiving. Forgiving me. He kept giving me mercy. And he kept bringing me around until we got the victory. Because I couldn't do it by myself. And then the Lord stepped in when I made it possible for him to. Okay, now. So. There's no limit to forgiveness. So now let's let's do look at the chasm between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind in verses 23 through 30. So uh, then Jesus gives this parable, Matthew 18, 23, 24, said the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who went to take account of his servants. He went to find out, you know, what you've been doing, how things going. Have you been getting, you know, being profitable or are you causing me trouble? And when he started going through the accounting, well, there was one guy brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, by one estimate, John Bevere gives us, it was, this was a weight in gold and it would be worth about, are you ready for this? And this is important. Okay, we don't know that this was the exact amount, but it's important that you see by the same units of measurement, okay, it was about 14 and a half billion dollars, about 375 pounds of pure gold that he owed this old boy. Yes, it was a servant owed the king. And verse 25 says, he didn't have what it took to pay it. Who's going to? Okay. So the, the king, his lord, commanded that he be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had and payment to be made. It was a price he couldn't pay. There was no payment plan that was going to make it up. There was no negotiating. Whatever the cost, it was going to take his life and all of his family's life to settle the debt. Then the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. It's not something that was ever going to happen. It was a number that was unreachable. It was a number that was unpayable. It was a bill he could never pay. But he's saying, can we work something out? He said, look here, if you'll give me a little more time, he's asking for mercy. We'll work out something. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and he loosed him and forgave his debt. Fourteen and a half billion dollars gone. You don't owe me anymore. Verse 28. So the guy that had just been forgiven 14 and a half billion smackaroos, he went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, using the same measure that brought the 10,000 talents to 14 and a half billion dollars. You know what this old boy owed him? 4,000 bucks. Okay, 
He's just been forgiven for $10.5 billion, and he walks out, and he runs into one of his partners that owes him $4,000. And he reaches up and grabs him by the throat, choking him out, and says, you better pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, the $4,000 servant, fell down at the $14.5 billion servant's feet and said, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Does anybody see a problem with that? No, 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 no. The, the big picture, yeah. Anybody see a problem with him throwing him in prison? He can't pay the debt off in prison. So you know what he's telling him? I decided you're done. Never forgiven. Never restored. You're there. Brother Kevin? Okay. He can never repay his debt. So now we've got a type. This parable is God forgave the $14.5 billion. I held on to the $4,000. Okay, the comparison is, is there's one unpayable debt and through compassion, grace, and mercy, that debt was forgiven. He couldn't pay it. You and I can't pay the debt we owe the Lord. So he paid it for us on Calvary. He gave his life. But the second debt is payable. It can be made right. Do you know that in the Bible days that 100 pence was a hundred days work. That's doable. It's fixable. The first is a debt I owe God and the second one is somebody's offended me. Think about it. Anybody done anything to you that lines up with what you did to God? No, not really. Not really, especially, Brother Shannon, when I was going to hell anyway. Before I sinned the first time, I was lost. I had no hope. He made a way for me before I ever messed up that stayed the same when I messed up. He made a way for me. So when his fellow service, this is important, you've got to receive it. I've never seen this in my life. So the other servants saw what happened. So they went and told the boss. That dude you just forgave $14.5 billion, he threw one of our partners in jail for $4,000. Then his, the, the king called him back in. He said, you wicked servant. I forgave thee all that debt because you desired me. You, you asked me. You asked for mercy. Shouldn't you have had compassion on your fellow servant just like I did on you? And the Lord was wroth, angry, and delivered him to the tormentors, listen, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother, their trespasses. Hear me now. If the word of God is true, unforgiveness has the power to resurrect sins that God already forgave me of. Mm. Listen, it can resurrect my own forgiven debt from a place that is unreachable even by the devils in hell. Nobody can hold my past against me when it's under the blood, but unforgiveness can bring it back to life. I think we need to be making sure we got everybody forgive. Huh? Because I don't want to be lost. I'm telling you right now, I don't want to be lost. And you do understand that you come to church every day. You can give everything you got. You can witness. You can do this first one thing, then the other. And hold on forgiveness. And he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But Lord, we did all of this. But you didn't 
forgive. Because if we don't forgive, Calvary don't mean squat. When we refuse to forgive as emissaries and disciples of Jesus Christ, we are declaring Calvary not good enough. Now, he said, do it from your heart. So the reader of our heart is watching and waiting to see if we mean it because you better not be cooking up a plan right now to say you forgive somebody and hold on to it in your heart. Because you can talk to your blue in the face, but if your heart's not right, he won't forgive you. So I'm moving and grooving, okay? The unforgiven servant was turned, the one 14 and a half billion dude, he was turned over, the King James Version, excuse me, says, to tormentors. I want you to hear me right now. That is a guard in a prison, I looked it up, you're welcome to do it, whose sole job was to inflict physical and mental torture As an act of judgment, you take that for what we will, but it is plain. There are things we suffer because we hold on to unforgiveness. Uh, it is agreed upon by many doctors. I want you to hear me right now. You can look this up. Verify it. I want you to. Don't just take my word for it. I want you to. It is agreed upon by many doctors that certain diseases can be linked to bitterness and unforgiveness. If you hold on to unforgiveness, you'll be turned over to the tormentor and you will be afflicted mentally, physically, and emotionally because God can't help you if you hold on to unforgiveness. Oh, Lord. Listen to me. Here's where we are right now. Here we go, Brother Josh, Brother Marcus, and all the rest of you that talked about forgiving yourself. And there might be one aspect of this where the one you haven't forgiven is yourself. Which, hear me right now, I'm not being ugly, and I'm sympathetic to you because I struggle with that too. Because I know what a jughead I've been. All right? But I want you to know something. Hear me right now. I'm not being ugly. But I'm telling you, under God's plan, for me to keep bringing up my failures is a cop-out that keeps me from going to the next level. I can say, well, I can't get over my past. There is no different in us forgiving ourselves than forgiving somebody else. I'm not being ugly, but I'm just telling you because it's the same process whereby we're forgiven and it's the same avenue called the blood of Jesus. All right? Oh, we're not buying it right now because we want to hold on to that. But I want to let you know something that if we do not forgive ourselves, it's the same penalty as if we hold it against somebody else. Hear me right. I'm fixing to get you, Lacey. Self-martyrdom earned you exactly zero points on the salvation scale. You, we cannot be so pitiful. Oh, listen to me right now. Listen to me right now. I wrote the book on being pitiful to try to get out of things. I guarantee you, we can play the victim card when we haven't done what we're supposed to do and we got a whole long list of reasons why we didn't do it. And it all will come back to, well, I just ain't no good. Oh, I'm, I'm telling the truth right now. I don't know if I'm helping you or not, Josh or Marcus, but I'm helping GL. All right? You know what? That ship has sailed. When I bring that stuff up, you know what the Lord says? Well, you better stop that. I'm going to bring everything back on you. Better forgive yourself. Why do you have to forgive yourself? Because you don't have power God doesn't have. And God has forgiven you. Stop negating the power of the cross. It's the same principle in forgiving ourselves. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Lacey. I almost forgot you. The same thing. 
Now, I, I want to say that there's a, a sweet little way that we can fix all of that. But the truth is, when we come down here and throw up our hands and repent, we better get that covered too. Oh, it is. We're never more like Jesus Christ than when we forgive. It's a choice. It's a gift. Yes, sir. Brother Kevin. Mm-hmm. Right. We get it. We do what we can. I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm going to move on. I know it sounds harsh. Y'all don't think I'm mean, do you? Y'all don't? You all right with me, Josh? Yeah, I'm not being mean, man, but I'm telling you, you all right with me, Marcus? Okay, but I'm telling you, the same principle to forgiving other people applies to forgiving us. We hold on to that many times because it becomes a place where we can run and hide. We can hide in our pitiful actions and get out of having to be responsible for moving on. It's just pride. Yes, sir. Yes. And until, until we can forgive ourselves, and, and when we forgive ourselves, like I said, it's the closest we will ever come to understanding God's mercy to us. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. We get to fulfill what we tried our best to fulfill yeah. by being happy to say, can't do it, Lord. Right. Yes, it is a breakthrough. Yeah. It is a breakthrough. Now, I want you to know something. The enemy also uses that self-flagellation against us and accuses you. You know what you did. You know what you did. But Brother Billy just gave a great example to us that we need to. That's why I found a place. I, I got the Holy Ghost first over there. But when I was in Louisiana, the devil started attacking me. He made me think about killing myself. I was telling myself, I think the world's better off without you in it. What an insult to God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Okay? But I had to come to the, some realizations, so I just went in the church one night, and I walked to a certain spot, and I could go there right now. Uh, Highway 442, La Ronja, Louisiana, 70443, and I could tell the devil, you're a lying dog, because it was right here where me and the Lord came to an understanding. And I told the Lord, I need some grown-up witness, kind of like what Sister Stacy did Sunday. I told the Lord, I said, I need a grown-up witness because I'm sick and tired of that enemy telling me I'm no good, telling me I never really had the Holy Ghost, telling me I ain't been forgiven. So I'm, whoo, I'm going to meet you right here. And the rest of my life, when I get under attack from hell, if I got to get in my truck and drive seven hours, I'm going to go to that spot about right here and I'm going to stand there and I'm going to let the enemy know you're a liar. Yeah, right. That's right. And God has forgiven me. Let me hurry. The second thing, I'm almost done and I'm going to get done with this and that's almost like a miracle. If I get done with this in one night, anybody can forgive their self. <laughs> the unforgiving servant was called to repay the original debt. But guess what? He couldn't do it. The reason is there is no more sacrifice for sin except Calvary. Look at here. You're not getting a pass. To the church at Ephesus, Brother David, he said, you are a good group of people, but I got something against you. You've left, your, you've left your first love. You've messed up. You got off track. And he said, here's what you're going to have to do. Repent and do your first works. You know what that means? Ain't but one way that you're getting out of this lesson right, and that's forgiving, folks. So if you get in yourself in a mess and you get in bondage and you get in affliction and you're all jacked up because you didn't forgive somebody, let me tell you how to fix it. Hey, Lord. Way down here. Yeah, way down here, Lord. Way down. It's me, the dummy. I thought I could be God. It ain't worked out all that good for me. 
if you give me a little time, if you'll be patient with me, I want to get it right. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to be moved with compassion. Huh? Because you know why? He's got a lot invested in you. Yes, he does. You know what it's called? Calvary. Huh? Calvary. One more thing. This applies to any believer who refuses to forgive any offense. The disciples didn't have to ask God to declare this parable to them. He did it on his own because it's that important. Your eternity hinges on it. It is impossible to be like Jesus and operate in accord with the Spirit and withhold the very thing Jesus died for, forgiveness. He died that we might be forgiven. And when we withhold forgiveness, we are operating in an arena that's above Calvary. And that has nothing but destruction written on it. We have got to line ourselves up with the will of God. And Brother Jesse, we are never more like Jesus Christ than when we forgive. Stand with me. I have these... This is a forgiveness prayer. Sister Leanne was here the first night I ever gave this, August of something, 2014. And I preached on forgiveness. This is a forgiveness prayer. It has five steps. All right? I'm going to lay it up here. You're welcome to come get a copy if you want. But it tells you exactly how to pray and release forgiveness. It's first, name your hurts. Name everything. Everything you're thinking about. Second, forgive them all. You named them when they hurt you, name them when you forgive them. I've done this, okay? I'm not. And then it's just like Jesus on the cross and Stephen when they're being ex executed, what'd they do? Lord, forgive them. First thing I'm going to do, they've offended me, but I'd like for you to give, forgive them before I do. I'm going to ask you to forgive them. Then the next thing is, Forgive me for holding on to those feelings. Forgive me for any part I played in it. Forgive me for the resentment I carried. Forgive me for being weak. And then, I know it's gonna, this is going to throw us, then you forgive God because he didn't stop it from happening. Huh? He could have fixed it. But he didn't stop it from happening, Brother Shannon. You want to know why? Because I needed it. I needed it. There they are. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word, truth, the spirit. Thank you, God, for the power of forgiveness. God, it's got to be a part of our daily life, a part of our Christian walk. I pray you'll let this word sink in. I pray that everybody watching online, we're so grateful for our online attenders. And pray those that are here that will go home and watch it again and realize this is a big deal, Lord. Our eternity hinges on it. And so it goes without saying that any further we're going to go in revival hinges on it too. Let it be a part of our life and let us surrender to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday night is still, there's a rally. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, there's elements. Sunday morning at 11, there's worship service. Thank y'all for hanging with me. Yes, ma'am.